So one of the basic regions of the cerebrum that we've just finished discussing is the cerebral cortex. So the next thing we are going to discuss is the white matter that is the region of the cerebrum that is directly deep to the cerebral cortex. So this white matter is responsible for communication between the cerebral areas, between the cerebral hemispheres, and even between the cerebrum itself as well as lower areas of the central nervous system, the brain and the spinal cord. Now, this white matter will consist of myelinated fibers, specifically axons that are bundled together, forming what we call tracks. So if we were looking at myelinated fibers or axons in the peripheral nervous system, then they will be referred to as nerves. But since we're in the central nervous system, we will be referring to them as tracts. Now, tracts can also be referred to as fasciculi. So that would be the plural form. If we're looking at one tract, then it would be referred to as a fasciculus. The three types of tracts are the association fibers, the commercial fibers, and the projection fibers. So let's begin with the association fibers. So these are connections within the same hemisphere. So one example of an association fiber are the arcuate fibers. So these arcuate fibers are shorter association fibers. So in other words, the myelinated fibers or axons are short. Now, why is that? Because these arcuate fibers are only meant to connect one gyrus to another. So let's look at the images down below and find these arcuate fibers, these shorter association fibers, so we can find them right over here. So if you look carefully, you can see these blue curved lines, and these are the shorter association fibers. In other words, the arcuate fibers. So let's say that the premotor cortex is communicating with the primary motor cortex of our cerebral cortex. So how is that possible? Well, that's made possible by these arcuate fibers. So these arcuate fibers will connect essentially one gyrus with another gyrus. Another example of association fibers are the longitudinal fasciculi. So these longitudinal fasciculi are longer association fibers. So the myelinated fibers or axons are much longer than the arcuate fibers. So why is that? Because the longitudinal fasciculi are meant to connect one lobe to another lobe. Now, I cannot emphasize enough that these are within the same hemisphere, either the right cerebral hemisphere or the left cerebral hemisphere. So if we look at the image down below, here's your longitudinal fasciculi. So for example, the prefrontal cortex wants to communicate with the visual cortex or the primary visual cortex, which will be found in the occipital lobe. And of course, the prefrontal cortex is found in the frontal lobe. So how are they going to communicate? Well, they're going to communicate through these longer association fibers, once again referred to as the longitudinal fasciculi. So the areas that I'm highlighting in yellow are these longitudinal fasciculi. The next white matter of the cerebrum are these commissural fibers. So these are bands of fibers that will connect the two hemispheres together. So a good example of that is one that we've already discussed in the previous slide called the corpus callosum. So the corpus callosum happens to be the largest commissure. So if we refer back to the image down below, here is your corpus callosum. So take note of the direction in which these axons run. So they run from side to side. Why? Because they're meant to connect the two hemispheres together. In other words, the right and left cerebral hemispheres. Another example of these commissural fibers are the anterior commissure and the posterior commissure. So the image that we have here is only showing us the anterior commissure. But pay attention once again 
to the direction in which these fibers run or these tracks run from side to side. Why? Because they're meant to connect the two hemispheres together, allowing them to freely communicate with each other. The last bundle of myelinated fibers or axons are the projection fibers. So this is what's going to connect the cerebrum with the lower areas of the central nervous system. In other words, it's going to link the cerebral cortex to the diencephalon or to the brain stem to the cerebellum, and even the spinal cord. So the fibers that enter the cerebral hemispheres from lower areas of the central nervous system are referred to as ascending tracks, while fibers that leave the cerebral cortex to travel to lower areas of the central nervous system are referred to as descending tracks. Let me illustrate this out so that way it's made even more clear. So let's say we're connecting an area of the spinal cord to the cerebral cortex. So that will be the ascending tracks. It's moving from inferior to superior, ascending. Now, if let's say the cerebral cortex wants to communicate with the spinal cord, then we'll have descending tracks. So in other words, these tracks are going to move from superior to inferior. An example of these projection fibers will be the internal capsule. And what that is, is a collection or a bundle of these projection fibers. Therefore, forming thick bands of white matter. Why white matter? Because these are myelinated fibers or axons. And don't forget, these internal capsules will consist of both ascending and descending fibers. So if we look at the image on the top right-hand corner, here are your projection fibers, and a cluster of them or a bundle of them will form what's called the internal capsule. So we have one internal capsule on the right and one internal capsule on the left. And as it's moving towards the cerebral cortex, pay attention to how they radiate out or how they fan out or how they spread out. So we refer to that part of the internal capsule that spreads out or radiates out as the corona radiata. So the corona radiata are these internal capsule fibers that radiate through the cerebral white matter as it's making its way to the cerebral cortex. So if we look carefully, I will highlight the corona radiata on the top right hand corner and take note of how it fans out or spreads out. And if you look down over here, there is your corona radiata. Once again, these are where the projection fibers are radiating through the white matter until they get to the cerebral cortex. Now, will they contain both ascending tracks and descending tracks? Absolutely, just like the internal capsule which once again are bundles or collection of projection fibers. So I've included a number of images that I would like to discuss and point out these myelinated axons that are bundled together forming tracks. Remember, this is what we find in the white matter of the cerebrum. And the white matter of the cerebrum is directly deep to the cerebral cortex. So the first type of myelinated axons that are bundled together are the association fibers. So the association fibers are connections within the same hemisphere. So an example of an association fiber are the arcuate fibers, and these are shorter association fibers. Now, why are they shorter? Well, because they're meant to connect one gyrus with another. Here are those arcuate fibers. And again, they're just meant to connect one gyrus to the neighboring gyrus. Another type of association fiber are the longitudinal fasciculi. So these are significantly longer association fibers. Now, why are they longer? Well, it is because it is meant to connect one lobe with the other. So here is our frontal lobe and here's our occipital lobe. So these two lobes are on opposite ends of the cerebrum. So the frontal lobe can communicate with the occipital lobe through these longitudinal fasciculi. 
The next type of myelinated axons that are bundled together that we find in the white matter are the commissural fibers. So these commissural fibers are meant to connect the two cerebral hemispheres together, allowing them to freely communicate with each other, one of which is the corpus callosum, which happens to be the largest of the commissural fibers. So the corpus callosum, once again, connects the right and left cerebral hemispheres. Therefore, they run side to side. And we can find the corpus callosum over here in the image on the top right-hand corner. And another example of a commercial fiber that we see is the anterior commissure. The last type of bundled myelinated axons forming tracts, which also are referred to as fasciculi, are the projection fibers. So these are meant to connect the cerebral cortex to lower areas of the central nervous system. And they consist of ascending tracts and descending tracts. So ascending tracts allows the lower parts of the central nervous system or lower areas of the central nervous system to communicate with the cerebral cortex. So we have these ascending tracts to allow that to occur. And if the cerebral cortex wants to communicate with certain areas of, let's say, the spinal cord, then we have descending tracts. So these projection fibers run up and down the central nervous system. And if we take these projection fibers and bundle them together, then we form what we call the internal capsule. So this internal capsule, which I'll go ahead and highlight in yellow, okay, we have one on the right and one on the left. And as they approach the cerebral cortex, they fan out, they spread out, or they radiate out. Therefore, it's referred to as a corona radiata. One thing I want to point out that I did not discuss in the previous slide is the decussation of the pyramids. And what this represents are the projection fibers that crosses over to the opposite side. So in other words, the projection fibers on the left side of the spinal cord, right, so I'll put left here, and right, this is the right cerebral hemisphere, and this is the left cerebral hemisphere. So if you notice, that crossing over occurs at this decussation of the pyramids. So those projection fibers that are from the left side will cross over into the right side, into the right cerebral cortex, as well as the right projection fibers will cross over into the left cerebral hemisphere. So what we have is the contralateral. So for example, the primary motor cortex at the right cerebral hemisphere, as it descends, the descending tracks crosses over to the left side. Therefore, the right primary motor cortex will control the skeletal muscle on the left side of the body, while the primary motor cortex on the left cerebral hemisphere crosses over into the right side, therefore controlling the skeletal muscle on the right side of the body. Now what I've included are actual pictures of brain tissue. So these are not illustrations, these are actual brain tissue. So let's look at the picture down over here, okay, which I thought was pretty cool and this is why I included it in this particular slide. So if we look carefully, we're focusing on the white matter of the cerebrum. Here are those projection fibers that are clustered together, forming the internal capsule. And as they approach the cerebral cortex, they start to fan out. So there's your corona radiata. And if we look at the image to the right of that, here are your longitudinal fasciculi. So this is meant to connect again one lobe with the next. We could even see the arcuate fibers. So these arcuate fibers, the shorter association fibers, will connect one gyrus with the next. And if we look over here, we more or less can see the same thing. So here are the longitudinal fasciculi, right? One of those longer association fibers. And you could see the projection tracks or projection fibers, once again, that run up and down and they fan out forming the corona radiata. And we can even see the arcuate fibers if you look close enough. Now, this image, we can see the corpus callosum. And they run side to side. And again, I think this is pretty cool. Connects the right and left cerebral hemispheres, allowing them once again to freely communicate with each other.
So out of the three basic regions of the cerebrum, we've already discussed the first two, the cerebral cortex and the white matter. Well, let's now discuss the third basic region of the cerebrum, and that is the basal nuclei. So the basal nuclei are nuclei that lie deep within the cerebral white matter. So I like to refer to these basal nuclei as islands surrounded by an ocean of white matter. So what are these islands? Well, they represent the nuclei. What are nuclei? Well, they're clusters of cell bodies of neurons found in the central nervous system. If we're only looking at one cluster of cell bodies of neurons in the central nervous system, then it's referred to in its singular form, nucleus. Do not mistake this as the nucleus of a cell. That's the organelle. This is not what this is talking about. Now, the cluster of cell bodies of neurons, this time in the peripheral nervous system, rather than referring to it as a nucleus, we refer to it as a ganglion. And if we look at two or more of these clusters in the peripheral nervous system, then it's referred to as a ganglia. So what we are talking about, of course, are nuclei. So clearly, this is the central nervous system. So the cell body of the neuron, once again, is the part of the neuron where we find the nucleus. Well, we also find nissel bodies that take on a gray color. Therefore, these nuclei are gray matter. So going back to my analogy, you want to think of these basal nuclei as islands of gray matter surrounded by the ocean of white matter. So what are the functions of these basal nuclei? Well, they're involved in the subconscious control of skeletal muscle tone. They also coordinate learned movement patterns and rhythm. For example, while walking. The basal nuclei controls the cycle of the arm, so we swing our arms back and forth and we move our thigh muscles. That is because of the basal nuclei. Furthermore, the basal nuclei will inhibit antagonistic muscles, those opposing muscle groups, which will allow for smooth movement and prevent any unnecessary movement. So we're not moving in a jerk-like fashion. It's a nice cycle as we move our arms and as we move our thighs. And again, this is all happening subconsciously. We are not aware that the basal nuclei is doing this. Another good example is let's say you're deciding to pick up a pen. So you consciously reach out. You extend your arm and grasp the pen with your hand. So in the meantime, subconsciously, the basal nuclei will operate to position your shoulder and stabilize your arm while monitoring the intensity of the movement and will make any necessary modifications and adjustment so that movement is smooth. We're not jerking. So in essence, the basal nuclei is preventing any unnecessary movements. The activity of the basal nuclei is inhibited by the substantia nigra of the midbrain. This substantia nigra, the neurons found in this region of the midbrain, once again, the substantia nigra, will release a neurotransmitter called dopamine. And what happens is that it prevents the basal nuclei from becoming overactive. So basically it's saying, hey, basal nuclei, calm down. I'm releasing dopamine to make you less active. You don't want to get out of hand. So if there is damage to the substantia nigra of the midbrain, or if it's not adequately releasing dopamine, what then? Well, what's going to happen is the basal nuclei will become more active, resulting in a gradual increase in the muscle tone. Furthermore, we now have uncoordinated movements. And this is seen with people or individuals with Parkinson's disease. So what exactly is this basal nuclei consisting of? Well, it consists of the caudate nucleus, the putamen, and the globus pallidus. So we combine the putamen and the globus pallidus, then we form what's called the lentiform nucleus. Now, if we combine all three, the caudate nucleus, the putamen, and the globus pallidus, then we form the corpus striatum. 
So if you look down at this image, here is your caudid nucleus, here is your putamen, and here is your globus pallidus. Once again, if we combine the putamen and the globus pallidus, then we form the lentiform nucleus. And if we combine all three nuclei that make up this basal nuclei, then we have the corpus striatum. 